America is pursuing ambitious reductions in our carbon emissions. And we've increased our investments in clean energy. We will do our part and help developing nations do theirs. But the science tells us we can only succeed in combating climate change if we are joined in this effort by every other nation, by every major power. That's how we can protect this planet for our children and our grandchildren. In other words, on issue after issue, we cannot rely on a rule book written for a different century. If we lift our eyes beyond our borders, if we think globally, and if we act cooperatively, we can shape the course of this century as our predecessors shaped the post-World War II age. This is a factual video. We're showing the documents as we speak. Congressional acts, congressional record, law dictionary definitions. This country's been deceived and the reason we can't fix, seem to fix the problem in Washington is because they're not correctly addressing the problem. They're keeping the real problem from the people. Once the American people know the deception and the deception is out of the way, the solutions are easy. You need two elements and the two elements are the Supremacy Clause, which is Article 6, Section 2. Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the, of, the, of the United States Constitution, which holds the Constitution to be supreme law of the land, and it pretty much strikes null anything that tries to supersede it. And the second is the will of the people. The law has been in place the entire time. This entire constitutional amendment that's got all this jurisdiction and everybody upset about gun control and income tax and all this other stuff that's coming at us, health care and everything else, is all a 14th Amendment creation. The 14th Amendment is not the citizenship the Constitution created for, the, for us to be. The Constitution made us a citizen of the state. That's found in Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1. The 14th Amendment in 1868, 90 years later, 89 years later, gave us the citizenship of the United States, which is the Municipal Corporation. 28 U.S.C., United States Code, subsection 3002, part 15. The United States is a Municipal Corporation. By making you a citizen of a corporation instead of the citizen of the state, you're now part of the property of that corporation. And, and that corporation is owner and head of assessor of all corporations in the United States and owners of all property thereof, as we're going to show in the documents. The CSR reports for Congress, I want to talk about them. Every member of Congress, both the Senate and the House, get a copy from the Committee on Terminating the State of Emergency. A lot of folks don't know we've been in a state of national emergency since 1933. Uh, nobody comes back from Washington, D.C. telling everybody this. As a matter of fact, the 2008 Senate report, which you can find on my website under documents, right at the bottom, it says a 2008 CRS report for Congress. Page 5 of that document, which is page 5 of 19, which is CRS-2, the top paragraph, makes clear that Executive Order 6, signed by the Secretary, not the President, so it's not even a real executive order, is where it ratified the fourth, said the 14th Amendment was ratified. Not a constitutional Congress. Executive Order 7 said it was lawful and ordered and published. Now I got to thinking about that as, a, as my research went along because President Andrew Johnson gave a speech in 1867 going against the Reconstruction Acts and the 14th Amendment because it created a different form of government and a different citizenship than what the Founding Fathers created and intended. So therefore the Supremacy Clause, whether this thing was ratified or not properly, should strike it with null. Everything that we're dealing with today, income tax, whether it was ratified or not, it's a dog chasing its tail issue. The income tax is only made for the 14th Amendment citizen. That's why that citizenship is the only one required to pay it. They're taxing their corporations. It's a corporate tax. It don't matter if it was ratified or not. They're not going by a real law. That's what the people don't understand. Once you understand how the problem's coming at you, the solutions are easy. That, all, all I'm going to do is remove the veil. You might vote for somebody different than me, and that doesn't matter. But, the, but what's going to matter is that we're all going to have to get our rights back somehow. And if you don't know how you lost your rights, how are you going to get them back? And that's what I'm teaching. That's all. I mean, you can, you can vote for somebody else. Just make sure they know this. But my question to them is, if they don't know this, then how are they going to fix anything? What I'm about to teach, show you all. And if, and if they do know this, how can they keeping it a secret from you all? They're not telling you. You see, in 1867, an act to create a different form of government, which the Supremacy Clause should have struck with Noel right there. Think about it. That different form of government is different than what the Founding Fathers wanted us to have. The Supremacy Clause is there like, like the ultimate weapon to get rid of this thing. We've been playing with firecrackers. We've got a stick of dynamite in the drawer, and nobody's ever touched it. 
it wipes this whole thing out. That's what I'm try I've been trying to point out, and that's the only reason I really got up and decided to run for Senate, because the people that know this ain't saying nothing, and no one else knows it, and you can't fix nothing if you don't address the problem correctly. And this is how you fix it. In 1867, they also set up the court system for this new form of government, the United States, which is the municipal corporation. 1868, they illegally threw that 14th Amendment in there, which, by the way, it was supposed to have been a political choice citizenship. You see, they can't impair, deny, restrict, or even question your right to go back to the republic form of government. It's inconsistent with their form of government. But since basically the past 140 years, this choice has basically gone unknown, unrecognized, and buried. People think this corporate form of government and citizenship is the only one there is. It's the unlawful one. I mean, think about it. If you're a law-abiding citizen and you love your country and your constitution, and you might think maybe some of these laws might be needed or whatever, I ask you to, take, to, th to think of the constitution and consider this little analysis. When given a choice between living in a lawful, legal, a lawful constitutional form of government, which our founding fathers intended us to have, or an illegal unconstitutional form of government, which one should you choose? The lawful one, which created a truly free people. We're not supposed to have all these taxes and, and restrictions and government up in, in our business. They don't have no business there. And they've only done it through the 14th Amendment. I don't know how case law would have ruled differently in the future. But I know many cases are decided on the 14th Amendment, such as immigration was a 14th Amendment decision, prayer was struck down as unconstitutional through your 14th Amendment a citizenship, Roe versus Wade abortion was a 14th Amendment decision, displaying the Ten Commandments in public was a 14th Amendment decision. I mean, I don't understand how these would have, I mean, they might have been, they would have been ruled differently probably at a state level and a republic form of government because every state was sovereign, its own republic. Uh, but it definitely wouldn't have been ruled, the way, uh, ruled on the way it has. And like I said, I'm publicly challenging everyone running against me. I don't care how many letters you got after your name. I'm just an old country boy. If you don't know any of this, how are you going to fix anything? And if you can't fix anything, we've had 150, 140 years of, 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 the, of the suit to tie and the political lie. I, I mean, it's time that you get somebody up there that can at least fix this thing. Maybe, you know, I ain't got, the, I ain't got all the money y'all got because I spent every dollar I have trying to wake y'all up. So, I mean, it's the best I could dress for today, but I can fix this. And if you can prove me wrong, I'll withdraw from the race. Because I've got no business going to Washington if I can't fix anything. And if you can't fix anything, I mean, how can you even look the American people in the eye and tell them to vote for you? Hi, I'm Sean Stone. Join us in our mission to resurrect the Republic here on Buzzsaw. Central Intelligence Agency. It was described by witnesses as... You may know of Thomas Lacavara Stewart. He's a talk show host for Resurrect the Republic and Dirty Uncle Sam Truth Radio broadcaster. Uh, he is known for being someone who's very vociferous in his attack on what has occurred since the creation of the 14th Amendment. And uh, he's also been uh, involved with the Bundy Ranch scenario and has firsthand experience of what happened there and what, what was ongoing as far as the government operation um, against the Bundys. So he's going to join us today to speak on both topics of much interest. So thanks, Thomas, for joining us. And, and uh, we've got a lot to, to cover, but to start out, I know your, your show, Resurrect the Republic, is uh, very outspoken in its, in its, in its uh, you know, uh, the thesis, basically, that we have, since the 14th Amendment, um, undergone basically a complete reorganization of what, it used, what the Constitution meant, and we have basically been usurped as persons to become citizens of the United States Corporation. Right. The ability that people have uh, to information which would, logic would contradict, uh, but also I was going to ask you a little bit about... Um, the platform that it provides for fringe and radical views, uh, not just in Russia, but worldwide, as, as sort of the, the extreme fringe is given a, a platform uh, for what otherwise would not be considered reputable television. You know, most broadcasts wouldn't have on the, the, the types of voices uh, with these conspiratorial theories. About it, I mean, 
the use of raw violence, which they do a lot of on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. I'm here to give you guys a message. This message could save this nation. It's the answer. It's the truth. Unadulterated and untarnished by the years and by the school system. Stuff you're not taught in school. That in 1868, 11 states delegates were forced out of the ratification process of the 14th Amendment. That 14th Amendment changed the jurisdiction of the Constitution forever. It changed it in a way that has been hidden from the American public and created in very much a secret constitution. When those delegates were forced out at gunpoint by the Union Army, they forced in a ratification of an amendment that was supposedly about slavery and freeing the slaves. That's not true. Just like legislation today, like the Patriot Act, is most certainly not about being a patriot. I can tell you right now that what it did was it created an unlawful government. President Johnson said at the time that it would make the law itself unlawful and create a de facto government. And that's exactly what it did. He was impeached and by the way acquitted. And you know what that means. Acquitted means he was right. So what is the 14th Amendment? Well, how is it done? What is it done? It took two words, person and citizen, and redefined them as corporation and also made us subject to the jurisdiction thereof. No involuntary servitude shall be made, but they didn't mention anything about voluntary servitude or what is known in England as serfdom, debt enslavement. You see, I came 2,500 miles to stand up for Clive and Bundy and the Bundy Ranch. It wasn't about cattle. It certainly was not about just the ranch. It was about a man who almost stepped out of time from the 1800s. Back from when the days of the Constitution was not tarnished or perverted by international bankers. And you wonder why these politicians get away with doing all the things they do and not going to jail. It's called 14th Amendment jurisdiction and it empowers the following jurisdictions. Obamacare, Roe v. Wade, the FBI, ATF, BLM, DEA, the IRS, the Federal Reserve. All of those jurisdictions, if you took the 14th Amendment and pulled it out, it'd all collapse. They'd have to be reorganized themselves and disarmed. We have a domestic standing army in this country now, and that's all 14th Amendment jurisdiction. There's only one way to stop it. Judge Lander H. Perez said so, and that is public awareness to be raised on a scale that enough people could stand up at the same time and do something. And that's why I came to Nevada. My name's Tom Lacavara Stewart and my relatives were there in Fall River, Massachusetts, in Boston, back in those days. And I can tell you right now, we gotta stand up for this. We have to stand up for liberty and there's only one way we can do it. And that's with your help. You need to spread this message and spread this word. This is the truth. Resurrectorepublic.com. Click on articles and you'll see it right at the top. All of our research in one master article. The 14th Amendment is unconstitutional. We don't give you the poison fruit. We give you the tree. All these Second Amendment groups, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, we all need to get together and take out the one that usurped it all and gave us privileges in the, point, in the place of rights. These are inalienable rights given to us by God. And I'm going to take them back. The use of raw violence, which they do a lot of on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. 1.4 billion hits is a lot of hits. Yeah. So people will go to the, the use of raw violence, and then that will be used as, uh, you know, part of a thesis on uh, some conspiracy theory. So I, I think what's interesting cause. about it, I mean, the use of raw violence, which they do a lot of on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. 1.4 billion hits is a lot of hits. Yeah. So people will go to the, the use of raw violence, and then that will be used as, uh, you know, part of a lot.
lot of on their YouTube. Mm -hmm. 1.4 billion hits is a lot of hits. Yeah. So people will go to the, the use of raw violence, and then that will be used as uh, you know part of a thesis on uh, some conspiracy theory that then is is played out. Uh, I I uh, wondered, uh, uh, Peter, your your take on this. This, this question, I think you've hit on, on one of the key issues here, uh, which goes takes us all the way through the problems at stake. They're not fringe anymore. These groups. Uh, what talking about a France where Jean-Marie Le Pen's far-right party is surging in the polls. We're talking about a Hungary where Jobbik, uh, the far-right party, is rising. Corporate trust, a citizenship, it made you a citizen of a private corporate trust, and at the same time it made you a beneficiary in a territory. And it's a voluntary citizenship. That's why it was never ratified. If you check a little bit deeper, it was ratified by Executive Order 6, announced legal by Executive Order 7, Wikipedia. Then you know, if you dig deeper, you'll find out it was never the executive order that put them both in commission was never signed by the president. It was signed by the Secretary of State, William H. Seward. Now, every former government, above and beyond the Constitutional Republic, the, the citizen of the state that would give us all the sovereignty back, comes from the jurisdiction of the 14th Amendment. The only way it has presumptive validity used upon us, because it was never legally ratified, just like Ron Paul says in the congressional record, 15641 through 15646, is by making it a political choice. You can't repeal a political choice. They used the corporate trust law to bind us to a different citizenship. The Founding Fathers created a citizen of the state in Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1. This made you a citizen of the United States. That's a municipal corporation of the District of Columbia, the 10-mile strip, doing business as the United States, a DBA. It's a, it's a legal term. It's a name. The term like United States that has several meanings, Black Claw Dictionary. Here's the sad part. The Rockefellers, that are, the Rothschilds family that we, where we fought the Revolutionary War, but was behind it in the War of 1812, they're the same ones that own that corporation. And now the American folks are learning the Fed, the Fed Reserve is, is not federal and it's not reserved. It's a private corporation of 12 banks merged, I mean, seven, seven, seven families merged together. Then you, then, you, then you learn the IRS is a private branch of that same corporation, and you learn that these folks have owned this corporation since 1871. The trees are behind it. They set you up for the citizenship of it in 1868. 1867, they set the judicial system up for it. Four years before the bankruptcy, by the way, that's not a normal course of events. They set up a citizenship three to four years before the bankruptcy. In 1870, the states should ask for representation in this, in this, which is still one year before the bankruptcy. And how do we go bankrupt when old Hickory paid off the debt when sending soldiers war state to state and Mr. Lincoln printed the greenback dollar to finance the war? And the Senate report from on the, on the committee to terminate the national emergency, 1973, public information, just top it in, I've got it in my room, says we've been in a state of national emergency since E01. Remember, this is hung on us by E06 and 7. That was never signed. It's a political choice. If they even hinder, deny, or question your right to go back, the entire contract becomes illegal. It's voluntary. That's how they hung it on you. And if you see, that's how they do it. Deny, impair, question, foreign state, your right to go back to the republic form of government, right here. Three legal peaceful solutions right here. Instead of fighting the fruits of the poison tree, I give you the tree. Thank you. And why it's effective, I think you had mentioned that it provides this voice for, for fringe voices, extremists, and it works because it provides uh, a place for these people, a place where these people can congregate and feed off of each other's biases. Uh, it, it's almost like a community that is almost like a cult, I would say, that is formed uh, online and they mobilize and they they feel like they are part of some enlightened um, fight against the establishment that they, um, and they, they find a home. They find a place where they're heard and uh, they find a sense of belonging.
they find an outlet where they can where they can um, a platform to to voice their deranged views. And um, I know that uh, formerly of of Radio Free Europe, uh, Mr. Lack, who has has since departed, had gotten a lot of uh, criticism for comparing tomorrow. A full committee hearing on cybersecurity. And um, this comes within our purview on this committee. And it, I mean, not trying to be dramatic about it, when, when, the, when the internet was invented, everybody fell flat in their face. They were so thrilled. And the world began to do business in a different way. Now, both the President Bush's Director of National Intelligence, Mike McConnell, who I greatly respect, and uh, President Obama's Director of National Intelligence, Admiral Blair, who I greatly respect, have labeled cybersecurity perpetrated through the internet as the number one national hazard of attack on the homeland in West Virginia, uh, on, in West Virginia, in America, anywhere else. So, I mean, it really, it really almost makes you ask the question, would it have been better if we'd never invented the Internet and had to use paper and pencil or whatever? And that's a stupid thing to say, but it's, it has genuine consequence because it's on the Internet that these acts of shutting down, you know, they have the television saying that ads every day saying that the uh, D Department of Defense is, is um, attacked three million times a day and it's true. Um, everybody is attacked. Anybody can do it. People say, well, it's China and Russia, but there could be you know, some kid in Latvia uh, doing the same thing. I mean, it's an individual act. It doesn't require a sleeper cell. It doesn't require any uh, you know, ammonia or explosives. It's just an act. And um, yet it's an act which can shut this country down. Mm -hmm shut down its electricity system, its banking system, shut down really anything that we have to offer. It is an auto system, its banking system, shut down really anything that we have to offer. Mm -hmm. Shut down its electricity system, its banking system, shut
Well, the Lincoln myth serves the purposes of the regime, both Democrat and Republican. It serves the purposes of a regime uh, in which power is completely centralized, in which decentralization of power is viewed as suspect, and probably you want to bring back slavery, they suggest, if you favor the states having any powers. It's Lincoln who inaugurates this new version of the United States, a version that's completely at odds with its Jeffersonian foundation. So if sh sure, if you want to exercise unchecked power over the American public, you foster these myths. Question. Did the Emancipation Proclamation free the slaves? Answer. It established and permitted slavery in the border states. You really have to read the document before you can understand that. I was intrigued by your comments about Abe Lincoln. I mean, I've read that you said that you don't think we should have fought the Civil War. Well, I don't think, I, I think there would have been a better way. Have you studied the history? Every other major country of the world uh, was able to get rid of slavery without a civil war. So the civil war wasn't fought over slavery. The civil war was fought over unifying and making a strong centralized state. The 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery in the United States, was not something President Lincoln thought needed to end the civil war. In fact, he said that if keeping slavery legal would keep the Union together, he would have kept slavery legal. In uh, Lincoln's first uh, inaugural address, he pledged his support to enshrine slavery in the Constitution. His views on race were closer to those of the Ku Klux Klan than the NAACP, and he made this very clear His troops burnt courthouses, raped women, robbed banks, killed civilians on a large scale. Lincoln, to his dying day, was looking for ways to deport the freed slaves somewhere in the world. And he illegally suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He had the army imprisoned tens of thousands of northern civilians without due process. He was the most tyrannical, uh, most disingenuous, least faithful to the Constitution president we've had in American history. Now, I, I was on Bill Maher uh, a, a couple, about a year and a half ago or so, and you came on, and you, uh, you came on uh, by, by satellite, uh, and you were explaining about the Civil War, how it didn't need to be fought. Uh, and I was at first like, he's saying it didn't need to be fought. But when you explained it to me, I thought it was one of the most pragmatic, reasonable things I've ever heard a politician say. The, the war advanced regardless, and uh, it was pursued, of course, with uh, so much uh, pain and suffering. 
I, if Republicans don't understand the important aspects of what Ron Paul is saying, then I, I don't think we'll continue to exist as a, as a party, certainly not as a majority party. Lincoln believed in rationality. But led by people who did not ignore the moral issues of the day, like Abraham Lincoln. I, I'm not going to get involved in a flag like that. That's not a flag that I, that, that I recognize or that I would uh, hold up in my room. And Lincoln's the person who re-centers the country in the Declaration of Independence. That flag, frank, frankly, is divisive and it shouldn't be shown. The Tenth Amendment doesn't allow Abraham Lincoln said it best. And I, uh, and I subscribe to something Abraham Lincoln uh, wrote about and spoke about. And we had better design a war so ruthless that in the end they cannot continue to fight. We try to find some nice, pleasant, let's negotiate, talk, get together, be good friends. That's fine if you don't mind the Union breaking up. Since the founding, Americans had had fierce political arguments over topics such as the creation of a central bank, slavery, and westward expansion. But throughout, the relative independence of the individual states from the central government continued to be respected. The Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, written anonymously by Jefferson and Madison, asserted the then commonly accepted right of the states to nullify federal laws that contradicted the Constitution on its face, such as the Alien and Sedition Acts, which suppressed speech critical of the federal government. The Civil War, usually described as a war over slavery, was really fought in part over the question of whether the southern states had the right to nullify anti-slavery laws and tariffs passed by the northern dominated federal government. And therein lies a tension that would haunt the U.S. for another century and more. Freedom can obviously be suppressed by a central government, and freedom can sometimes be suppressed by individual states and defended by the federal government. But having the central government intervene to fix local affairs in the short term often erodes liberty in a more subtle way over the long term by setting a precedent that decreases the state's autonomy and imposes homogeneity. When all the states are subject to the same centralized code of laws, there is no easy way to escape bad laws by moving from one state to another. In the process of fighting the Civil War, Lincoln violently crushed the idea that the states were at liberty to participate or not to participate in the Union. He levied war against seceding states, though, ironically, levying war against any of the states is the one thing that the Constitution defines as treason in Article 3, Section 3. During the war, Lincoln also curtailed several freedoms, by censoring and prosecuting an anti-war press, by unleashing troops who murdered civilians, raped women, burned courthouses, and robbed banks in the southern states, by blockading southern ports to prevent trade, by suspending habeas corpus, and imprisoning some 16,000 suspected Confederate sympathizers in the North without trial by spending money before Congress had authorized it, by introducing a draft, and by introducing the first and ultimately unconstitutional income tax. Lincoln was not impressed by the idea that the public should continue to criticize the government even in times of crisis. Would you heckle a tightrope walker in the midst of a delicate and dangerous performance? No, said Lincoln, quote, you would hold your breath as well as your tongue, and keep your hands off until he was safe over. 
the government are carrying on immense weight. Untold treasures are in their hands. They are doing the very best they can. Don't badger them. Keep silence, and we'll get you safe across." Unquote. He preferred safety over liberty. Does this sound familiar? But whether Lincoln liked it or not, the government had its critics. Resistance to the draft was so intense in New York City that rioting over the issue killed hundreds. But the draft would return during future wars, and the income tax would be reintroduced in a far more permanent fashion a half century later by the so-called progressives, starting out quite modestly, but becoming a complex and pervasive tool for social control. Unlike today's presidents who believe in bailing out struggling businesses and providing welfare to corporations and to the poor, President Grover Cleveland did not even believe that the government should provide relief for struggling workers in terrible downturns, such as the Depression of 1893. Let the market sort it out, as it soon did. Just as America was moving in the direction of laissez-faire capitalism, though, intellectuals and elites and organizations of farmers and populists who grew to hate Cleveland were beginning to look in the opposite direction. They wondered what might be achieved by more government planning and whether bigger government might achieve wonders of coordination and planning as impressive as had the strides made by big business. Alas, things would not work out quite as they had hoped. It's not about justice. It's not about agenda. It's not about mobilizing people. It's about dialing for corporate dollars. These two parties have sold the U.S. government and the American people to the highest bidders. Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? Tonight, what if the Constitution no longer applied? What if the whole purpose of the Constitution was to limit the government? What if Congress's enumerated powers in the Constitution no longer limited Congress, but were actually used as a justification to extend Congress's authority over every realm of human life? What if the president, meant to be an equal to Congress, has instead become a democratically elected term-limited monarch? What if the president assumed that everything he did was legal just because he's the president? What if he could interrupt your regularly scheduled radio and TV programming for a special message from him? What if he could declare war on his own? What if he could read your emails and your texts without a search warrant? What if he could kill you without warning? What if Supreme Court justices no longer looked to the Constitution to determine the constitutionality of a law, but rather simply to what justices who preceded them thought about it? What if the rights and principles guaranteed in the Constitution have been so distorted in the past 200 years as to be unrecognizable by the founders? What if the 50 states were no longer sovereign entities, equals to each other, and parents of the federal government they voluntarily constituted? What if the states were mere provinces of a totally nationalized and fully centralized government? What if the Constitution was amended stealthily, not by constitutional amendments duly ratified by the states, but by the constant and persistent expansion of the federal government's role in our lives? What if the federal government decided if its own powers were proper and constitutional? What if the Constitution were no longer the supreme law of the land? What if you needed a license from the government to speak? to assemble or to protest against the government? What if the government didn't like what you planned to say and so it didn't give you the license? What if the right to keep and bear arms only applied to the government? What if posse comitatus, the federal law that prohibits our military from occupying our streets, were no longer in effect? What if the government considered the military an adequate dispenser of domestic law enforcement? What if cops looked and acted like troops and you couldn't distinguish the military from the police? What if you were not secure in your person, in your papers, and in your property? What if federal agents could write their own search warrants in defiance of the Constitution? What if the government could decide when you were and were not entitled to a jury trial? What if the government could take your property whenever it wanted? What if the government could continue prosecuting you until it got the verdict it wanted? What if the government could force you to testify against yourself simply by labeling you a domestic terrorist? What if the government could torture you until you said what the government wanted to hear? What if people running for president actually supported torture? What if the government tortured your children to get to you? 
What if government judges and government lawyers intimidated juries into convicting the innocent? What if the government could send you to your death and your innocence meant nothing so long as the government's procedures were followed? What if America's prison population, the largest in the world, was a cruel and unusual way for a country to be free? What if half the prison population never harmed anyone but themselves? What if the people had no rights except those the government chose to let them have? What if the states had no rights except to do as the federal government commanded? What if our elected officials didn't really live among us, but instead all had their hearts and homes in Washington, D.C.? What if the government could strip you of your rights because of where your mother was when you were born? What if the income tax was unconstitutional? What if the states were convinced to give up their representation in Congress? What if the government tried to ban you from using a substance in your body that is older than the government itself? What if voting didn't mean anything anymore because both political parties stand for big government? What if the government could write any law, regulate any behavior, and tax any event? The Constitution be damned. What if the government was the reason we don't have a constitution anymore? What if you could love your country but hate what the government has done to it? What if sometimes to love your country you had to alter or abolish the government? What if Jefferson was right? What if that government is best which governs least? What if I'm right? What if the government is wrong? What if it is dangerous to be right when the government is wrong? What if it is better to perish fighting for freedom than to live as a slave. What if freedom's greatest hour of danger is now?